Never ever think small. If you're going to accomplish anything, you have to think big. You have to go and shoot for the stars. The biggest challenge most people have is because they think small. And the reason why people think small and why they choose small little goals is because they're afraid to fail. They know that if you shoot for a big goal, then the chances of failing are very high. And they're afraid of failing. It's one of the most common things why people are frozen and why they can't make a move in life because they're scared of failing. I say to myself, hey, I'm not worried about failing because that's part of life. You're not going to go and win everything. And how far can you fall? Look at this. This is the ground. That's as far as I can fall. And you know something? That the only time you really consider the failure is if you fall and you don't get up. But if you get up, you never consider the failure. So I never considered myself a failure. I always considered myself a winner, even though I fell every so often. But I always got up and I always moved forward. This is the important thing. I never had any patience, of course, for sm thinking small. If you do something, then go all out and do it well. And this was not just the case in bodybuilding. I didn't just want to be a bodybuilding champion. I wanted to be the greatest bodybuilder of all times. I wanted to have the most muscle, the, the most muscle of all times, the most definition. I wanted to win the most trophies, the most world championship titles. I just wanted to be the best. And the same is also in movies. I didn't just think about being in movies. No, I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to have above the title building. I wanted to become the highest paid entertainer. I basically wanted to be another John Wayne. What's wrong with that? ask me all the time, what is the secret to success? I think I can give you the long version here. And the long version is that I actually always had five rules. And everything that I did, I always used those five rules. And those five rules helped me to become successful in various different areas. And I think, I believe that those rules can be applied to almost anyone and everyone. You don't need to be a bodybuilding champion. You don't need to want to be a governor of California or to be an action hero or anything like that. If you want to excel in whatever you do, those rules are for you. It's that simple. I think that we all here like to be successful and we are driven. So that's why those rules apply to you. So my first rule is find your vision and follow it. You see, I think it's the most important thing that we have a very clear vision of where we go. A goal, where, where do we go? Because you can have the best ship in the world. You can have the best cruise liner, but if the captain does not know where to go, that ship will drift around the world and out there at sea and will never end up anywhere. And this is exactly the way it is in real life. If you don't have a goal, if you don't have a vision, you just drift around. And you're not going to be happy. This is why it is so important to have that vision. Now, I created that vision in Austria because I grew up after the Second World War. The problem was that everyone was so depressed because they lost the war that there was alcoholism everywhere. There was, of course, depression. There was a terrible economic situation. There was famine. There was starvation and all those things. And also, it was kind of a little place and narrow. I felt kind of, I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to escape. And I couldn't see myself really to work there and to stay there, to work in a factory or to work on a farm or to even to follow my father's footsteps and to become a police officer. I couldn't see that either. As a matter of fact, that's what my, my parents wanted me to do. But that's not what I saw. This was the vision of my parents, but not mine. And luckily, one day in school, I watched a documentary about America. And I found myself, 
I knew exactly that is where I wanted to end up. I wanted to be in America. Everything that I saw in the documentary, I just loved. Everything was so big. I remember the tall skyscrapers, the monstrous bridges, the giant freeways filled with beautiful cars, the huge jetliners, movie stars, Muscle Beach, and all of those things. I could not wait to get there. The question was just, how do I get there? How do I get to America? I mean, this was not a common thing to do way back in the 50s. No one had the money to travel or anything. But one day, I was fortunate enough to see a magazine. And that magazine showed me the path to America. And it was a bodybuilding magazine. And on the cover was this very muscular guy that was standing there like Hercules with a Hercules outfit. His name was Reg Park. This Reg Park was on that cover, and I remember the cover said, Mr. Universe becomes Hercules star. I read the article as fast as I could, learning about how he grew up in Leeds in England, poor, and how he trained five hours a day, every single day, and trained and trained and trained and lifted weights, and then he finally became Mr. Great Britain. And then he became Mr. Universe. And then he won a second Mr. Universe title and a third Mr. Universe title. And then all of a sudden he landed in Rome in Chinichita doing Hercules movies. And there he made millions of dollars and this, this money he took. He bought himself a gymnasium chain in South Africa and he became a successful gymnasium owner. And as I read, I became more and more certain about my own future. As I read this story, I was so excited, so interested. I knew exactly that I wanted to become another Reg Park. I know he laid out the blueprint for my life, basically. I could see myself, I could visualize myself clearly to be a champion on that same stage where he won the Mr. Universe, and then to move to America, then get into movies, and then become rich and famous. I had that vision very clearly laid out. I was so happy that I knew exactly where I was going. From that moment on, everything that I did, no matter how hard I had to work or how much I had to struggle, it didn't matter. It was a wonderful joy ride because I knew what the purpose was and I found my passion. The simple truth is, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have a goal, if you don't see your future laid out in front of you, you're just floating around without a purpose. And I think that the numbers speak for themselves. This is why so many people around the world are unhappy with their jobs. I mean, in America, 74% of the people hate their job and would like to change jobs. But think about that. That means that only a quarter of the Americans love their life's work. I mean, that is a very depressing statistic. I always smiled when I worked, no matter how hard I worked. I always had a great time, no matter what I did. It didn't matter if it was in bodybuilding, or if it was in the movies, or if it was as governor. I remember in the pumping iron days, people ask me in the gym all the time, why are you smiling all the time? Why are you so happy? You have to lift 50 tons of weights. You have to train five hours a day. I mean, I look at the other bodybuilders' faces and lifters' faces, and they look kind of depressing. They look sour. They're miserable that they have to lift weights. You, you don't look miserable, you look happy. And I tell them always, I say, I smile because I know exactly that every rep that I do, that every set that I do, every weight that I lift, I get one step closer to turning that vision of mine into reality and becoming that Mr. Universe. I could not wait to lift another 500 pounds in the squats. I could not wait to do another thousand sit-ups. I could not wait to do bench press, more bench press and more curls until I couldn't move my arms anymore because I knew that every rep got me closer to standing on that stage as a champion. As a matter of fact, when I lifted weights, I didn't really feel like I was lifting weights. I felt like I was lifting a trophy over my head each time I lifted. And to have all those bodybuilders around me and thousands of people screaming. And I tell you that this vision didn't just help me in bodybuilding, it helped me with everything, like I said. I remember in the movie business, there was many times stunts that I had to do where I got hurt, where I was in pain, in agony, and I had to do it over and over again. I remember one incident specifically in Conan the Barbarian. There, there I was crawling on all four, on rocks, over rocks and gravel, 
holding my sword right in front of me. And as I was crawling, the camera followed me. And it was around 30 feet that I had to crawl on those rocks and this gravel. And eventually, after 10 takes, my elbows, my knees started bleeding and hurting. And the director came to me sheepishly and said to me, he says, do you mind if we do another take? I need a close-up of you. And I said to him, no, I don't mind at all. I said, go and do as many takes as you want. He says, no, 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 I don't want to do that because I know you're in pain, you're bleeding. I said, no, 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 I don't feel any pain. I said, the only thing I see is, is the finished scene. This is why I did not feel that pain. I did not care if I was bleeding on my knees because I know that pain is temporary but the film is permanent. And I explained that to the director, so this is why I try to tell you, always discover your vision and the rest will follow. If you're going to change an area, you do three things. Number one, you focus on it and you get clear and compelling vision for what you want. If your body's not where you want it to be, I tell you there's one simple reason. It's not your focus. No, no, I focus on it. I focus all the time on how fat I am. No. You see, if you focus on crashing into the pole, trying not to, the more you try not to, what you focus on, that's where the energy goes, that's where you go. Right? We all know that. But what people tend to do is, I'm saying focusing on what you want, not what you don't want. And not only just focusing on what you want, where you focus and say, well, I'd like to be strong, I'd like to be energetic, I'd like to be fit. It's focusing and making it compelling. You can't just focus on it. You've got to create a clear and compelling future in that area that will pull you towards it so you're not trying to push yourself. If there's an area you're not improving in, think of three pillars, if you would. Pillar one is get focused and clear. What's compelling? Where are you? Really? And don't lie? Where do you want to be? And make it so compelling you can't help it when you wake up in the morning you want to transform this area of your life. So the quality of your life already is better just because you are so excited about what you're after. When you do that with your body or your emotions or your finances or time or any other area and you start focusing and you're clear, you're going to have energy. You're going to have drive. You're going to start to do something. How do you make sure what you do really work is model someone who's already successful? All the tools I come up with, some I've obviously created, but the foundation came by standing on the you know, shoulders of other giants. You know, I went out and found somebody that's already got the result. Why reinvent the wheel? Success leaves clues. Find the best, figure out what they're doing. Do that. Alter it. Find your, your view of it. But start with what already is working rather than starting from scratch and trial and error. So emotion is in. If we get the right emotion, we can get ourselves to do anything. We can get through it. If you're creative enough, playful enough, fun enough, can you get through to anybody, yes or no? Yeah. If you don't have the money, but you're creative or determined enough, you find the way. So this is the ultimate resource, but this is not the story that people tell us, right? The story people tell us is a bunch of different stories. They tell us we don't have the resources, but ultimately, decisions shape destiny, which is my focus here. If decisions shape destiny, what determines it is three decisions. What are you going to focus on? Right now, you have to decide what you're gonna focus on. In this second, consciously or unconsciously, the minute you decide to focus on something, you gotta give it a meaning. And whatever that meaning is, produces emotion. Is this the end or the beginning? Is God punishing me or rewarding me, or is this the roll of the dice? And emotion then creates what we're gonna do, or the action. So think about your own life, the decisions that have shaped your destiny. And that sounds really heavy, but in the last five or 10 years, 15 years, haven't there been some decisions you've made that if you made a different decision, your life would be completely different? So the bottom line is maybe it was where to go to work and you met the love of your life there. Maybe it was a career decision. I know the Google geniuses I saw here. I mean, I understand that their decision was to sell their technology at first. What if they made that decision versus to build their own culture? How would the world be different? How would their lives be different? Their impact. The history of our world is these decisions. When a woman stands up and says, no, I won't go to the back of the bus, she didn't just affect her life. That decision shaped our culture or someone standing in front of a tank. Psychological strength. That's the difference in human beings that I've seen of the three million I've been around. Because that's about my lab. I've had three million people 
from 80 different countries that I've had a chance to interact with over the last 29 years. And after a while, patterns become obvious. You see that South America and Africa maybe connect in a certain way, right? Other people say, oh, that sounds ridiculous. It's simple. So what shapes you? Two invisible forces, very quickly. One, state. We all have had times. Have you had a time you did something and after you did it, you thought to yourself, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. It was so stupid. It wasn't your ability, it was your state. Your model of the world is what shapes you long term. Your model of the world is the filter. That's what's shaping us. That's what makes people make decisions. When we want to influence somebody, we've got to know what already influences them. And it's made up of three parts, I believe. First, what's your target? What are you after? Which I believe it's not your desires. You can get your desires and goals. How many of you got a goal, a desire, and thought, is this all there is? How many have been there? Say aye. So it's needs we have. I believe there are six human needs. Second, once you know what the target that's driving you is and then you uncover it for the truth, you don't form it, you uncover it. Then you find out what's your map. What's the belief systems that are telling you how to get those needs? Some people think the way to get those needs is to destroy the world. Some people is to build something, create something, love someone. And then there's the fuel you pick. So very quickly, six needs. Let me tell you what they are. First one, certainty. Now these are not goals or desires. These are universal. Everyone needs certainty that they can avoid pain and at least be comfortable. Now how do you get it? Control everybody, develop a skill, give up. Smoke a cigarette? Well, we go for certainty differently. If we get total certainty, we get what? What do you feel if you're certain? You know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. What would you feel? Bored out of your mind. So God, in her infinite wisdom, gave us a second human need, which is uncertainty. We need variety. Third human need, critical, significance. We all need to feel important, special, unique. You can get it by making more money. You can do it by being more spiritual. You can do it by getting yourself in a situation where you put more tattoos and earrings in places humans don't want to know. Whatever it takes. The fastest way to do this if you have no background, no culture, no belief in resources or resourcefulness is violence. If I put a gun to your head and I live in the hood, instantly I'm significant. Zero to ten, how high? Ten. How certain am I you're going to respond to me? Ten. Here's what we really need. Connection and love. Fourth need. We all want it. Most people settle for connection because love's too scary. Now, these first four needs, every human finds a way to meet. Even if you lie to yourself, even if you have split personalities. But the last two needs, the first four needs are called the needs of the personality, is what I call them. The last two are the needs of the spirit. And this is where fulfillment comes. You won't get fulfillment from the first four. You'll figure a way, smoke, drink, do whatever, meet the first four. But the last two, number five, you must grow. We all know the answer here. If you don't grow, you what? If a relationship's not growing, if a business is not growing, if you're not growing, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how many friends you have, how many people love you, you feel like hell. And the reason we grow, I believe, is so we have something to give a value. Because the sixth need is to contribute beyond ourselves. Because we all know, corny as it sounds, the secret to living is giving. You talk a lot about purpose, why we are created as humans and why we are here. Like, what is the purpose of life? Why have we been given life? I think we're here to struggle and to learn. I don't think we're here to be happy. That's why when we keep going back to the happy argument, I've always found that kind of frustrating and annoying. Yeah. When someone goes, oh, but I want to be happy. Why? Why? Like, I, why do you want to sit there and laugh? Like, like you're, you were happy your entire childhood. That's your happy days. You're allowed to be happy as That's a kid. It. It's all over now, right? You, you're a man. You have responsibilities. I think we're here to do important things, and important things are going to be difficult, and they're going to be hard, and you're going to get frustrated. But that's what gives you purpose. I think we're here to struggle. I think we're here to endure pain. Yeah. I think we're here to just see how hard we are to kill. I think yeah. that going through terrible things and living through them and, mm. and coming out the other side is one of the most fantastic things about being human. Uh, I think that... It's, it's almost like once you understand what life is really about, there's no emotion which isn't enjoyable. The only emotional state which can be seen as detrimental is feeling nothing at all. But if you're sitting at home and you're feeling truly heartbroken, at least you're feeling something, right? Least, and, yeah. and, and I think that's the whole part of being human. I, I think we're here to struggle. I think we're here to go through pain. I wake up each day and go, what can I attack? What problem can I solve? And, and look at history. Why did Genghis Khan wake up and want to conquer the whole world? Why did Napoleon conquer the world? Why did Alexander the Great conquer the just world? Mail. Just, yeah. you just wake up and just say, give me this. Give me that. I want all of it. Yeah. There's an army there. They're really big. We're better. Yeah. It's intrinsic. You need to go and conquer. That's, that's the purpose of life. 
Do you believe that God created us? So why did God create us to struggle? Because if you don't struggle, you don't learn. God created us to learn and understand ourselves and understand other people and understand the world. And what did I say earlier? I said that you don't learn a lesson without pain. Mm. So you have to struggle to learn anything. Mm. There's only two ways to learn things, the hard way or the harder way. If you're smart, you can learn the hard way. But in my experience, 99% of the planet only learn the hardest possible way. If you want to feel happy inside of yourself and you want to feel content and you want yeah. to feel stable inside of yourself, you need to live true to God. And I'm not saying you can't drink a little bit of alcohol or not party or not have a little bit of fun, but you have to be a good person. I don't believe in the societal paradigms in which they have tried to construct this idea of happiness. I don't believe or subscribe to the way that happy and sad is currently un understood by the masses of the population. I think if you are anything less than absolutely yeah. distraught, you are happy. You're a version of happy. Uh, it's like saying gray is a version of black, right? No matter how light the gray is, you can still call it a version of black. And unless you've gone through an event, which hopefully doesn't happen too often, like the passing of a family member or something yeah. that's truly destructive and detrimental to your mindset, besides these events, which hopefully only happen a few times in your life, you should be happy. If you're not crying or paralyzed in silence due to the absolute magnitude of a detrimental circumstance or the absolute magnitude of a negative event, then you are a version of happy. So I am always happy is the short answer. I don't believe in not being happy. I don't believe in not saying to myself I'm happy. I'm always a version of happy. And this chasing, this idea of chasing happiness and always being concerned and preoccupied with how happy you are is actually the biggest mistake that a lot of people make, I think, in the world today especially men who wake up and go, oh, I don't really feel happy, so I need to get happier. And that's how they end up down a yeah. hedonistic path of drugs or alcohol or chasing gambling, pleasure. chasing pleasure. I don't care how I feel. Yeah. I don't care if I feel happy or sad. It doesn't really affect what I do each day. I do the exact same things. I act the exact same way. I don't care. I don't put weight to the significance of the emotion. So I always consider myself a happy person, but if I woke up and I was slightly less happy one day than another, it wouldn't affect anything I do and I wouldn't put any relevance to it. Yeah. I'm human and that's life. So yeah, am I any happier now that I have hundreds of millions of dollars than before I was broke? Not really, but I was never unhappy. I'm, I'm, I'm the same state that I was then, that I am now. I have work to do and I will do it. It's, it's as simple as that. Well, also, there's no light without dark, and there's no joy without pain. You can't have a rainbow without a little rain. No matter how hard you chase pleasure and happiness, there's going to be dips and troughs in between. There's going to be come downs and downtrends, and you're going to have the juxtaposition between that time you were laughing your head off and acting giddish like a child, and the time that you feel depressed as such. And I think it's much better to just adopt a very disciplined, stoic mindset I'm always the same base level of happy regardless. If I lost all of my money today, I would be the same happy. If my net worth quadrupled, I'd be the same happiness. But as long as I'm alive and the people I, I care about and love are alive, and as long as I get, as long as God gives me the honor of doing my duties and providing for the people I care about, as long as I get to wake up and know that there's a whole bunch of people in the world who need me and I get to work hard to please them and do good for society and good for the world, then then I'm, I'm a vessel of God and I'm happy I'm happy enough to survive. That's, that's all I look at it as. I don't ever consider, how do I feel? That doesn't cross my mind. I have things to do. I'm, I'm too busy. I'm, I have things to do every single day. I have very important things to do. And how I feel really is not going to affect how I complete those tasks. And I, I, when I speak to men, they say I'm unhappy or I need to be happier. I think that's absolutely the wrong frame of life. You're a man. You have duty. You have honor. You have things you should be doing regardless of how you feel. And the people who are perma-obsessed with happiness or sadness i just think it's the wrong paradigm to view the the lens of life i yeah. think you should get up and do what needs to be done one of the keys is Remember where you came from. Keep that shit in the front of your mind. And when shit goes bad and it goes sideways, a lot of shit does, you're getting booed out of the fucking building or you're coming through this injury or people are you writing you off. Oh, you guys ain't gonna fucking make it. You know, any of that shit. You gotta, you gotta keep it in here. You, and it really has to, it should drive you.
this idea and this notion that you could be anything you want and you can accomplish anything you want, right? We hear that. You've heard that from the time you were little boys. You hear that now. You're already incredibly accomplished. You can win an NBA championship, MVP of the league. You could become president. You could become governor. You can have, you could be in, 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 in um, you could be in entertainment. You could do Charles and you could do Shaq. You could do that. You could do whatever you want to do. You guys know that. The thing that has worked for me is to remember the hard times. So, and I'm sure you guys all have your processes. And again, I'm going to tell you what's worked for me. So before a big movie comes out, before back in the days when I was wrestling with WWE, a WrestleMania match, anything big that would happen, I would always take a moment and I just remind myself, all right, I was evicted when I was 14. We were kicked off the island. We couldn't live in Hawaii. Had no place to live. Uh, a lot of shit happened then when I moved to Nashville. I was arrested multiple times by the time I was 16 years old. I gotta remember that. Um, if I were playing on this team, uh, which my, you know, my skills are, um, what's that term? Oh, the shits. So I don't ever play. But before I lace up, before I get on the court, before I play in these big games, before I go to the Staples Center, where history is there, those are, those are historic walls there at the Staples Center. Uh, I would remember that, and it allows me then to be present in the moment and understand, holy shit, the this, this stuff I have around me right now, this is the shit that I dreamed of when I was a kid. I am here. I played for University of Miami, played for great teams. Warren Sapp, Ray Lewis, they were my teammates. They were balling. Warren Sapp was playing tight end that time. I was starting defensive tackle. Yeah, they moved him over to D-line. And he looked at me, he's like, yo, dude, I'm gonna take your spot. I said, you ain't taking my fucking spot. He said, I'm gonna take your spot. I said, no, you ain't. We battled and he took my spot. <laughs> now, you can imagine how that fucked with me because there goes my opportunity. He went in, switched the defensive tackle, lit the world on fire. Well, what that did, it crushed me, it crushed my dreams. I had a piss poor senior year, zero production, no NFL, no combine invite, nothing. Finally went to the CFL. Calgary Stampeders making $250 a week Canadian. Canadian. And I had to send that shit home to my, uh, to my wife at that time. I had no money. So I remember that. When I got cut from Canada. I had seven bucks in my pocket. And I always tell that story. So now my production company is seven bucks. Advertising agency is seven bucks. Everything is seven bucks. So I always remember that. What helps me is to keep the hard times in the front of my mind because it allows me to go into these big moments that I've worked my ass off and you guys have worked your ass off. It allows me to go into these big moments with a different perspective. What it also does for me, and again, this just this is what works for me. Like, <clears throat> I keep my back, excuse my language, my back is up against this motherfucker every day. It's against this fucking wall. Excuse my language, it's in the room. But it's up against this motherfucker because it's what I believe in. And when my back is against this motherfucker, then there's nowhere to go. But that way, that's it. So I feel like this could be something, an ideology and mindset that could help you, could, if you look at it that way. Because you made it already. We made it. We're successful boys, and we're lucky boys to be where we're at. Oh, you guys made it. Everybody's rich in the room. Nobody's going to get evicted anymore. Anything you got, there's no more money problems, right? You got a lot of hands out now. Hey, can I get a little bit? Can I get a little bit? Right, that happens. <clears throat> but when you make it, for me, I need this. I need this. So every day, my back is up against this motherfucker, and this is how I operate. Now, doesn't mean you don't smile. Doesn't mean you don't laugh and joke, right? You're happy, I'm happy, I'm a happy guy. But when it comes to business, and when it comes to executing, it's up against this. And I gotta go that way. And I don't give a fuck who is in front of me. They're not gonna stop me. I feel like for me, it feels seamless. Because you prepared for so long. But it's just like you guys prepping for a game. 
that's the fun part. That's where it's like, fuck, it's fun, man. People are paying their hard-earned dollars to come see you. They're cheering, they're going bananas, they're booing the shit out of you on the road. It's, that's fun. That's what you live for. I mean, that's the juice right there. The prep is where the character's made. And I just don't mean the character I play, I mean the fucking, the character in here. So for me, the prep is getting with the director, getting with the producers, getting with the writers, getting with the, getting with the, so in essence, it's like getting with all your coaches and your different uh, position coaches and, and all the meetings that you have to have, right? So that's the work you put in. The key for me was, where does it start? What's the anchor? What's the anchor? So I could have all these ambitions and you guys have all these ambitions, which is great. It's important. I'll play this role. You'll play that role. I'll execute this thing and it'll come out this summer. You guys will execute this thing during the summer, right? When it's time to really put in a lot more work. But the key with me is just always finding what the anchor is. And the fucking anchor is getting up at four o'clock in the morning every day before anybody else and grounding my thought process is in the no one will outwork me. No one. I love and I respect you guys. Motherfuckers won't outwork me. All starts with this. Two hands, putting it to work. The anchor for me has always been the work in terms of the weight room training. So when I first started wrestling, I was six years old, rolling on the mats with my dad. My old man, a lot of you guys will know this. Yeah, Rocky Johnson. <laughs> my old man was Rocky Johnson. He was the first black WWF tag, WWF at that time. First black WWE tag team champions with Tony Atlas back in 1983. Uh, my uncles were the Wild Samoans. I come from a long line of pro wrestlers. Um, but before the wrestling part happened, uh, I was just in the gym putting in the work at six years old, rolling around on the mats. And finally, when I could touch weights at 13, that's what I was doing. But the weight part for me and the gym part has has always been, has to be the anchor. Look, at the end of the day, like again, I'll, that's it's the kind of stuff that I talked about at, at top is I have to hold on to uh, my dad in his pickup truck came down four o'clock in the morning, picked me up at in, in Miami from Tampa. We lived in a little shitty apartment in Tampa. He drove down in his little pickup truck to, to, to Miami to get me when I was cut from the CFL. I was driving up I-75. I don't know if you guys are from Florida. Any of you guys, if you know, it's I-75 is like, especially down in Florida, Alligator Alley. I'll never forget it. It's four o'clock in the morning. And I thought, well, fuck. The, I, I leave home like you guys left home. I'm ready to tackle the world, get after it, achieve my dreams and goals fucking crushed by 22, 23 years old. I'm, now I gotta move back in with my mom and dad. I played on great teams though. Wait a second, this is not supposed to be my future. I'm supposed to be in the NFL right now. I'm supposed to be making a lot of coin and buying my parents shit, buying me shit, taking care of my wife, but it never happened. So I pulled out my wallet. I thought, well, let me see how much money I have. I opened it up. I had a five, a one and change. I'm not fucking around. And, and I, and, well, at least I rounded up to seven bucks. But I thought, God, ain't this a bitch? I got seven bucks in my pocket. Where the fuck do I go now? What do I do? I can't go back to CFL because I, or, you know, the point comes where you hear that voice, the big runs over. Like, you're done, right? So I heard that voice. So as Coach was saying, man, I hold on to that shit. I'm telling you, I keep my back is up against this motherfucker. We laugh, we joke, we have a good time. Press is always fun to do. Sometimes you got to make it fun. That's another thing. You got to do your best to make press fun if you can. But my back is still up against this motherfucker. I do not forget it. What this also helps me do, and again, it works for me, is at some point you got to be fucking tired of not being number one. You have to be, and you got to fucking play angry. And I play angry. Now, I'm cool and calm with my approach. And when I step out on my field, which is a set or you know, like, there's some, and you're always gonna have haters, and haters are like, well, God damn, man, how many movies are you gonna make, or how much shit are you gonna do? Like, you do a lot of shit. I say, yes, it's my ambition. Of course, why not? I could do it. Yeah, I love what I do. And not only that, but in what world do we not work every day? It doesn't mean, it's just like you guys in the off season. You gotta work every fucking day, it doesn't end. My back is up against this thing, you know, and I, and I, and I started to play angry, by the way, and, and I, still, I still play angry. My last match, Brock Lesnar, transitioned, and I realized if I had to be great at something, I wanted to be great in this world of Hollywood and movie making and producing and entertainment, I had to commit 
And like you guys have to commit. Obviously you commit to something, commit to the goal. So I quietly retired. Two years later, I thought, what the fuck did I do with my career? Because my movies were not doing well. I was written off. I was like, it was around 2006, 2007. I was like, God damn. I left, I pulled a Jim Brown. I left when I was on top, like number one in the wrestling business. And I left, it was a ballsy, gutsy, some call it stupid move, but I had to commit and I had to follow what was in my gut. And at that time, I'll share this with you guys. And Will Smith is my boy. And I sat down at that time with the agency I was with. And they said, what do you want to accomplish? I said, I want to accomplish the world. I want the world and I want, I want Will Smith's career. But, and I said, and I mean this respectfully because I know he's here at this agency with us. I want to do it bigger and better. And they looked at me like I had three fucking heads and they were like, mm-hmm, okay. But I still stayed focused and I still had these, still put in the hard work with my two hands and that's it. And that's what it comes down to with you guys. One of the keys is remember where you came from, keep that shit in the front of your mind. And when shit goes bad and it goes sideways, a lot of shit does, you're getting booed out of the fucking building or you're coming through this injury or people are you writing you off. Oh, you guys ain't gonna fucking make it. You know, any of that shit, you gotta, you gotta keep it in here. And it really has to, it should drive you. We're here for one simple reason. He believed in the dream. I believed in the dream and our dreams come true and there's no reason every one of yours can't either. I used to sit in this little apartment and it was a room. As a matter of fact, the room was so small, I remember I was able to open up the window and close the door while sitting on the bed at the same time. It was like eight feet by eight feet by nine feet. And, but the one thing about that room, there was really very little distraction. So I would sit there propped up in bed and I'd go out with my big pen and, and legal pad and just start writing these, these stories. And, and most of them were, were, were very, very trivial. But there was something about the process of unrealized dreams. I was always brought back to this subject because I think it's one of the most enduring subjects and one of the most difficult passages for people to accept that they never were realized in their own lifetime, that they just didn't get that shot. I decided it was a time to come to California, so I went to California and I moved in the valley and things weren't going very, very well there. As a matter of fact, I had to go out and try to sell my dog because he was either uh, do that or, or uh, he just was not going to be very well fed. And then one night I went to see uh, Muhammad Ali fight. For one brief moment, this supposed stumble bump turned out to be magnificent in the fact that he lasted and knocked the champion down. I said, boy, if this isn't a metaphor for life, his entire life crystallized at that moment. He will be remembered for all eternity, at least in, uh, uh, among the fight fans. He did something extraordinary. I said, now that, that is probably what I need as a catalyst for an idea. A man who's going to stand up to life and take one shot and maybe go the distance. So I started to write. And it was one of those writing frenzies. And three days later, I came up with the script of Rocky. Now, the script by no means was a finished piece of material. It was probably about 90 pages, and maybe 10% of it remained in the final script, but it was done. So we're talking a little bit, and I guess I really wasn't right for the acting part. And on the way out, I said, oh, I don't know if it matters, but I do a little bit of writing. He goes, really? He says, he says yeah, I'm writing this, this story, this... Um, I have this thing about wrestlers, and I might do something about boxing. Well, he says, well, bring it around. And I thought, if I hadn't stopped on the way out, you know, that's why I tell all actors or writers, don't give up, keep talking. Eventually, you might hit a nerve somewhere, and they go, ah, come on back. And if they didn't say, come on back, or bring it later, and let's see what you've developed, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I have to give incredible credit to their, uh, to their insight and their patience and they're willing to take a chance, which um, it doesn't 
exist much anymore, unfortunately. Originally, when I brought the script to them, they were fairly enthusiastic about it. The one thing they were not enthusiastic about was me playing the part, and I really can't blame them at the time, but there was something inside of me that, that you know, this opportunity is never going to come around, and I really wasn't used to money, and I had no idea of what I would be missing, but the temptation started to come forward. First, it was... Uh, 25 grand and a hundred thousand dollars. I never heard of a hundred thousand because I had had like a hundred and six dollars in the bank and like I said I had to sell my dog and things were not looking very very good. Uh, my forty dollar car in the spin and it went up to three hundred and thirty thousand and probably I heard it went up to three hundred and sixty thousand and I thought all right you know You've really managed poverty very well. You've got this down to a science. You really don't need much to live on. I had, I had like sort of figured it out. So I was not um, in in any way uh, used to uh, to the good life. So I thought, you know what? If I, I know in the back of my mind, if I sell the script and it does very very well, I'm going to jump off a building. If I'm not in it. So this is one of those things where you just roll the dice and you fly by the proverbial seat of your pants. Say, all right, I gotta try it. I gotta just do it. I may be totally wrong, and I'm gonna be taking a lot of people down with me. But I just believe in it. We were working with the handheld camera at the time with with Garrett Brown, and it was uh, somewhat experimental. And he'd film me running through shopping malls and up down the steps and flights. Uh, I mean curved corridors along the river until finally my legs basically gave out and I'm like writhing on the ground and I want to rise up and say, John, I'm dying here. And he goes, no, no, use it. Use the pain. I said, for what? I mean, I'm in misery. He goes, well, no, no. You know, it's giving your character, it's giving him some depth. I said, it's giving me bruises. It's giving me like agony. I can't sleep at night. Like the scene where we just jumped down and saw this ship along the dock, this uh, uh, docked along the pier, and I said, "Just jump out, run as fast as you can along the ship," and 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 I'm running and running. I said, "You know what? My legs are buckling. I'm I'm literally going to crash down here. Teeth are going to go, jaw, face. I'm just going to be ground down to this flat-faced image. Please." And, and I just barely made it. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you wanna be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. You can't be alone. To really succeed, no man really is an island. When you find the right components in your life, the right people that gel with you, then you feel as though you, you're invincible. It may be a fallacy, but you at least feel as though you can, you can take all that life has to dish out. At the very end of our lives, if we can still say, you know, we were never humbled, we were knocked down, but we got up, and I can say, I lived life with integrity and I took all the blows, as the song says, and I'm, I still prevailed. I think that's, a, that's a, a good epitaph for anyone. It's all about dreams, you know, and by the way, dreams cost nothing, they're free. Uh, the hard part is just keeping them going and please keep them going because 
We're here for one simple reason. He believed in the dream. I believed in the dream and our dreams come true and there's no reason every one of yours can't either. Most of this generation quits the second they get talked to. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, or, or they get yelled at. It's so easy to, you know, to, to be great nowadays, because everybody else is, most people are, are weak. This, this is a softened generation. So if you have any mental toughness, any, any ability, if you have any fraction of self-discipline, the ability to not want to do it, but still do it. If you can get through to doing things that you hate to do, on the other side is greatness. What is it with our society? We are creating weak individuals, individuals that can't handle anything going wrong in their life. As soon as something goes wrong, they are given a prescription, not to fix the problem, to mask the problem. How about giving strategies to strengthen the mind? How about saying, okay, you've allowed your life to get to this point. Now take responsibility and dive deep into personal development. Learn why you feel this way, not because of the event. The scientific facts about why you feel the way you do and what you can do to strengthen it. The moment they are criticized, Rather than take any of it on board, rather than prove any of those people wrong, they give up. They attempt to defend the criticism with useless talk, but never with definitive action. The moment they are challenged, they crumble. The moment things get hard, they declare defeat. It must not be for me. It was their fault. If they didn't do this or treat me like this or say this, then I would have made it. No, you're just soft. You're weak. Tell yourself the truth. Because until you do that, until you look in the mirror and acknowledge that you are the problem, you'll never be able to grow into the person that is capable of achieving all those things you want. You are the problem, the only problem. Your mindset is the problem. Your attitude is the problem. It is no one else's fault, it's yours. If you want the good news, you are also the solution. You and only you. If you have character, that statement will change your life. If you have no character, you'll remain an average complaining hater like most other people. You are your only problem, and you are the only solution. Sure, big things happen. Tragic loss, things which no one would deserve. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the people who are one job loss away from a breakdown. One relationship break up, away from depression. One argument ruins their entire week. Come on, people. This is not how to live. Even with the big stuff, if you have perspective, if you know who you are, if you really, really appreciate everything you do have and believe everything is as it should be, all of those big things can be handled much better. Knowing your loved one would want you to be happy and move on. Knowing that living in pain and holding on to resentment is letting that person who did you wrong win. But letting go and living your life, loving your life, that is you saying, I won. That is you saying, I will not allow you to own any, any piece of my mind and spirit. That is true courage and mental strength. And I'm not saying avoid pain. Pain, suffering, failures, they are all part of every single person's life. There's varying levels of pain for sure. Some suffer more than others, but we all suffer at some level. Some choose consciously or unconsciously to live in that pain, and some decide to move on. You deserve to move on. Mental strength comes from those struggles. It is formed from pain. It is increased when you refuse to give up at times when most others would. 
It grows when you keep going, when things seem impossible. It grows when you push one more time past what you thought was your limit. It grows with consistency. That is mental strength. Excuses are for weak individuals, individuals who have no heart. Take responsibility for where you are now and commit to do something, anything, whatever it takes to make sure your future is better. You do have the choice. You can make excuses and stay where you are, or you can take responsibility, take action, and get where you need to go, where you deserve to go. What do you choose? Jeremiah 29 11 reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. I feel like I'm living that plan out. I feel like the things that happen to us in life, they're not designed to stop us. They're designed to reposition us so we can come in contact with what God really has for us. And so everything that, that I do, man, I do it to honor God because I feel like God gave me a second chance at life. And so I feel like I'm doing what God put me on this earth to do. You see, my mother had me when she was 15 years old, right? Over on the east side of Atlanta, we came up in this neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood, drug dealer on every corner, gang members in the neighborhood, two-bedroom home, 14 people, used to sleep on the floor. Got the opportunity to sleep in the bed one time out of the week. It was six of us in the bed, three at the foot, three at the head. And I came up with this dream pretty quick. I said, man, I want to go to the NFL because I had eight uncles in that house, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison. And so pretty quick, I said, man, I want to go to the NFL. And so I went to my big cousin tomorrow one night. I said, man, listen, I want to go to the NFL. And so we got to work for this thing. So the thing we're going to do every night, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action. Every night, we're going to race light pole to light pole with no shoes. So every night, we would get out on the street, race light pole to light pole. One night, a coach came down the street. He signed me and my cousins up for organized sports, right? First time being in organized sports. We get in organized sports. The thing was, after practice, everybody would leave to go home. And I always had to sit on the bench and wait on my mother because she worked that way. And so when my mother would show up in the park, it would be about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. So I'm sitting there, and when my mother would pull up, she drove an old Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up in the park, 10.30 at night. I would jump off the bench. I would sprint over to my mother. I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I have to do some extra drills. I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired. And every night, my mother would sit back in that car, and those car lights would hit that field. And he had a seven-year-old kid doing back backpelling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. But just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes, and so it made me dig a little bit deeper, it made me push myself a little bit further, it made me work a little bit harder. It created a certain level of sweat equity in what I was doing. It created a certain level of pride. And so I went to Crim High School, one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia, dropout rate higher than the graduation rate. People didn't go to college. I went to Crim my first day, I walked through the doors, a metal detective cop said, what's your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go D1. He said, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. He said, no, nah, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong guy. After my freshman year, my mother and father both came to me and they said, Inky, we're transferring you from this place. You got a scholarship at Tucker High School. They said, all you have to do is come and play your next three years. They guarantee you a scholarship to Georgia. I said, please, leave me at one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia. I can get a scholarship from this place. Son, nobody goes to college from there. Please, let me stay here. I can make it from this place. They transferred me anyway. First football game, tore the ligaments in my ankle, out for the season, ended up in a wheelchair. Went back to my parents. Will you please transfer me back to one of the lowest performing public schools in the whole state of Georgia? My pastor said, Inky, you really want to go there? 
I said, please transfer me back there. I need to go back there. And so the summer going into my senior year, we got blessed with a new coach. He came to me. I was done with football. He said, man, please come and work out for me. Just do one workout for me. I said, okay, coach, I'll come out. I'll work out. I ran a 40-yard dash. I did some cone drills. He came up to me after the workout. He said, son, what college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, no, you're not hearing me, son. What college do you want to go to? I said, man, I just want to go D1. He said, after the first couple of games, we'll put together a tape and we'll see what happens. After the first two games, I had nine touchdowns. It was all she wrote from there. And I'll never forget the day the University of Tennessee came in and a coach took a chance on me. He sat down with me and he said, son, I want to offer you a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. It was so crazy. I responded and I told him, I'm coming. And he laughed. He said, son, I don't even think you understand how the whole process works. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I said, you're talking to a kid that comes from a two-bedroom home, 14 people. You're talking to a kid that every morning when I caught the bus, I would race to be the first one at the bus stop, and I will be standing there shaking my book bag and my jackets out to make sure there were no roaches and rats. So when I tell you I am coming, I am coming. You don't even have to waste the university's money. I don't have to see the campus. I don't have to see the city. You offer me a scholarship, I'm coming. He said, yeah, Ink, but I still want you to take an official visit. I agreed. I went up on a Friday night. I'll never forget, they took me to Calhoun's on the River. It's a restaurant in Knoxville, Tennessee. We come out, we got a host, right? And so the job of a host, they're supposed to show you a great time on campus, take you to parties, make you fall in love with the place. And so I come out with my host and he said, Ink, there's a sorority party, there's a barbecue, and there's a basketball game. Which one would you like to go to? I said, man, if you don't mind, can you take me to my hotel? We pull up to the hotel, I'm getting out of the car. He said, wait, are you sick? I said, no, I'm not sick. You see what my host didn't understand? That night at the Marriott, that was my first time standing in the bed by myself. I think I cared about a sorority party? I think I cared about a barbecue or a basketball game? <laughs> but the next day when I saw that coach, I thanked him, and I still do this until this day when I see him. I said, thank you, not only for changing my life, but changing a whole generation's life that you don't even know you touch. So when I got back to Kirkwood, I went to everybody that told me I wouldn't make it. I went to that cop in that lunchroom and I said, I told you, you had the wrong guy. So now everybody's response was, Ink, why did you fight so hard to come back to Quim High School? You had a guaranteed scholarship across town at one of the top programs. Why did you fight to come back with a dropout rate was higher than the graduation rate, son? Why did you fight to come back to this place? And I said, you guys are missing a boat. And the thing that people didn't understand, the reason I had that decision and choice to make, it wasn't about Inky Johnson. Every night I slept on that floor with those roaches and rats, I had three little cousins that slept on that same floor as me. And you know what happened? When I went to college, you know what all three of them, I was the first one in my family to go to college. You know what all three of my little cousins did? Man, I don't have to sell dope. I don't have to join a gang. I don't have to end up in prison. I don't have to end up dead. All three of them got up off the same floor, went to college and graduated, and now they serve in the Army. That is why I went back to Krim High School. Had nothing to do with me. If every decision and choice you make is just about you, at a certain point you're going to hit something that's a lot tougher than you and it's going to make you quit because you don't have a driving force for why you do what you do. But when I got up to the University of Tennessee, it was simple. It was simple for me to give everything I had. My freshman year, I played special teams. My sophomore season, I broke the star lineup, had a really strong sophomore season. The summer heading into my junior year, I still remember the day where I was sitting in our film room and I was watching film on the California Bears. My defensive backs coach, Larry Slade, came in the room. He said, Inky, I got some good news for you. I dropped the click. I said, what is it? He said, man, you're projected top 30 draft pick, son. He said, all you have to do is play the next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I went out of the room. I called my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. I said, after this season, there will be no more struggle. I said, we would never miss another meal. I said, we would never experience another Christmas where we had to stand on the side of the curb and just be grateful. And I hung it up. First football game, I went out, played great, got an interception, shut Cal down. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, got late in the game, fourth quarter, guy dropped back, he threw the ball to a receiver coming out of my sideline. Me and the guy, we went head on. Soon as I hit the guy, I felt as if every breath of my body left. Body went completely limp, fell to the ground, I blacked out. Never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, I'll never forget, my teammates ran over, they said, Ink, get up, let's go. I said, I can't. I said, I can't move. They said, what do you mean you can't move? You're out of lockdown corner, man, we need you, let's go. I said, I know, man, but this time I can't move. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God. I said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. 
They got me over to the hospital, they took me back, they ran CAT scans, they brought me back into my room, and all in a 15 second time frame, the doctor came running in from the opposite side. He said, hey, get in there, we gotta rush this guy back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. I said, what? He said, son, you have busted up the clavian artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally, we have to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. When I opened my eyes from recovery, the same doctor was over me. He said, son, has some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I have to tell him I was about to die. I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is, Inc., you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, okay, cool. He said, but son, it's a strong possibility that you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but you wasn't in the park with me and my mother when I was seven years old and she was sitting in that Buick Riga after she got done working at Wendy's. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't come up in that two-bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't miss those meals and stay focused and never made an excuse. I never cheated. I never cheated. Like my conscience still until this day won't let me, like I can't cheat. I can't look myself in the mirror and say, Ink, you did a good job knowing that I cheated. I can't cheat. One of the greatest pieces of advice that my mother gave me was this, son, whenever you start, you make sure you finish it. And the problem with the world today, people get involved with things and if they don't like a certain person, if they don't like the process, if it's not what they thought it was, they quit. And what they don't understand about quitting, quitting become, becomes a habit that doesn't just affect you. Later on in life, when you get a wife and you get some kids or you get a family, it's going to come back to hunt you and it will one day affect them. That is why I tell you the process is more important than the product. It's not even about the outcome for me. It's about can you take pride in what you do as an individual and every night when you look in the mirror, knowing that you gave everything you had to it. And we have to get to the point where we're willing to impose our will on certain things. Impose your will on it. My life totally changed. And they gave me an opportunity to stop. And most people, when you give them an opportunity to stop while they're chasing something, they take advantage of it because they feel as if, man, why did this have to happen to me? I felt as if, why not me? This is the perfect opportunity to use this to be a blessing to somebody else. And you know what? It's not even about me to be truthful. It's not even about me. Now it's about repaying the people that invested in me and saw something in me when I couldn't see it in myself. At a certain point in life, it can't just be about you. And the moment that we understand that and every day we wake up, we understand that life is a blessing and life is a gift. And if you were to check out today, how would you want to be remembered? It's bigger than you. And no money doesn't have to be attached to it. It's about learning to work from the inside out in life and not from the outside in. When you work from the inside out in life, you understand your why, you understand your how, and you understand your what. What starts here changes the world. I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. That seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough battle-hardened seals, but the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. 
If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. During SEAL training, the students, during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as a sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never going to succeed. You were never going to have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list 
And at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot wall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level, 30-foot tower at one end and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life head first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish and fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, sometimes you have to slide down the obstacles head first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, Stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique ex extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater, using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light that comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented, and you can fail. Every SEAL knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm.
when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down in the Mud Flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. It will not be easy. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. Figures. You hear what I'm saying to you tonight? If you do the three things I tell you to do tonight, I guarantee you, whatever it is you want to do in life, you'll be able to do. You will be able to accomplish whatever you want to academically, financially, relationally, whatever. So three things. All right, I'm going to tell you the story. I got to get out of here. And the story is about, you guys have probably heard about this before. It was, a, it was a young man who, you know, he wanted to make a lot of money. And so he went to this guru, right? 
He told the guru, you know, I want to be on the same level you are. And so the guru said, if you want to be on the same level I'm on, I'll meet you tomorrow at the beach at 4 a.m. He liked the beach. I said, I want to make money. I don't want to swim. Guru said, if you want to make money, I'll meet you tomorrow, 4 a.m. So the young man got there at 4 a.m. He all ready to rock and roll, got on the suit. He should have worn shorts. The old man grabs his hand and said, how bad do you want to be successful? He said, real bad. He said, walk on out in the water. So he walks out into the water. Watch this. When he walks out into the water, it goes waist deep. So he's like, this guy crazy. Adrian, he's like, I want to make money. He got me out here swimming. I didn't ask to be a lifeguard. I want to make money. He got me in. So he said, come out a little further. Walked out a little further. Then he had it right around in this area. The shoulder area. So this old man crazy. He's making money, but he's crazy. He said, come on out a little further. He came out a little further. It was right at his mouth. My man, like, I'm about to go back in here. This guy is mine. So the old man said, I thought you said you wanted to be successful. He said, I do. He said, walk a little further. He came, dropped his head in, held him down, holding him down. My man getting scratching, holding him down. I got you. I know you brushed it out, but I got you. He had him held down. I need you for an illustration. He had him held down just before my man was about to pass out. He raised him up. He said, I got a question for you. Somebody answered the question for me. He said, when you were underwater, what did you want to do? Lee, I'm looking for a different word though than lip. What's that word? He said, I wanted to breathe. He told the guy, he said, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. I don't know how many of y'all got asthma in here today, but if you ever had an asthma attack before, you short of breath, SOB, shortness of breath, you wheezing. The only thing you trying to do is get some air. You don't care about no basketball game. You don't care what's on TV. You don't care about nobody calling you. You don't care about a party. The only thing you care about when you're trying to breathe is to get some fresh air. That's it. And when you get to the point where all you want to do is be successful, as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. And I'm here to tell you, number one, that most of you say you want to be successful, but you don't want it bad. You just kind of want it. You don't want it badder than you want to party. You don't want it as much as you want to be cool. You, most of you don't want success as much as you want to sleep. Some of you love sleep more than you love success. And I'm here to tell you today, if you're going to be successful, you've got to be willing to give up sleep. you got to be willing to work off for three hours of sleep, two hours. If you really want to be successful, someday you will have to stay up three days in a row. Because if you go to sleep, you might miss the opportunity to be successful. That's how bad you got to want it. You got to go days without, listen to me, you got to want to be successful so bad that you forget to eat. Beyonce said once she was on the set doing her thing, three days had gone by, she forgot she didn't eat. Because she was engaged. i never forget uh, when 50 Cent was doing his movie, I did a little research on 50, and 50 said that when he wasn't doing the movie, he was doing the soundtrack. And they said, when do you sleep, Empty? Sleep, he said, sleep. Sleep is for those people who are broke. I don't sleep. He said, I got an opportunity to make a dream become a reality. Football players, how many football players? Got anybody like football in here? Raise your hand, anybody like football? Emmitt Smith, I used to be a Cowboy fan before they did my boy Tom Landry wrong. I used to be a Cowboy fan. And watch this, there was a commercial. Emmitt Smith had won his first Super Bowl, and he had this commercial when he was lifting weights. I don't know if you saw the commercial when he was lifting, and he said, he said, Emmitt said, you know what? Ah, I won the Super Bowl, so I can rest now. He, had, he was doing his bench press. So he said, I won the Super Bowl, so I can rest now. So he throws up about 325, boom. And he rests for about two seconds. And he, boom, boom, boom. Did you see that? He'd already won a Super Bowl. He said, I think I'm going to take a rest. And he rests for how long? One second. Most of you won't be successful because when you're studying and you get tired, you quit. And I'm here to tell you today, if you got somebody came to my office the other day crying, I said, look, don't cry to give up. Cry to keep going. Don't cry to quit. You already in pain. You already hurt. Get a reward from it. Don't go to sleep. 
until you succeed. Listen to me. I'm here to tell you today that you can come here, you can jump up, you can do flips, you can be excited when we give away money. But listen to me, you will never be successful until I don't have to give you a dime to do what you do. You won't be successful until you say, I don't need that money. Because I got it in here. So listen to me, Emmett Smith said this at the end of the commercial. Emmett Smith said, all men are created equal, some work harder in free season. I'm going to say it again because you might have missed it. All men are created equal, some work harder in pre season. So that means that there are some people who are going to see the professor, going to see the TA, and even when the professor says, I don't meet with you, my TA meets with you, you say, I don't want to talk to your TA. I don't pay the TA. I pay you to teach me. So you're going to have to find some time to meet me. If I got to meet you at the mall, if I got to meet you at your house, you are going to see me. Listen to me. All men are created equal. Some work hard in preseason. When I went to college, guys were way smarter than me. 4.0s, 3.0s. They went to the Ivy League high schools, came to Oakwood from these great high schools. Most of them are not doing what I'm doing. Why? Because it's not about where you come from. It's about heart. You come to a place where, you know, being smart ain't enough. You gotta have heart. That's number one. Watch number two. Number two, catch number two. I wrote it down. I wanted to make sure you got it. It says, to be, watch this, watch this. We're talking about sacrifice now. The important thing is this. You're right, why I'm saying it. Because I only have about three more minutes. Listen to me. The most important thing is this. To be able at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you will become. That's the number two thing. You got to catch that one. To be able to, listen to me, at any moment, some of you, you can make sacrifices when Monday Night Football is not on. You can make a sacrifice. But when the game come on, for some reason, you just attach to it. For some of you, when your favorite show come on, you, you, can, be, you can make sacrifices on Sunday when ain't nothing going on. But when your favorite show comes on Monday, bam, some of you, you focus into the phone ring, and then you like, I gotta answer. If I don't answer the phone, I'm gonna die. I'm saying to you today that there's some of you, if you give up your cell phone, you would be successful. But your cell phone is more important to you than your success. I'm gonna say it again. I'm gonna hurt somebody. I'm gonna hurt somebody. Some of you need to give up your cell phone because the time you spend on your cell phone could be used for your success. The time you could be using to be successful, you're using it on the cell. And the cell phone is not bringing you nothing but a bill. And somebody has told you you couldn't live without it. I'm talking about going deep now, giving up stuff. Watch what it says. To be able at any moment to sacrifice what we are for what we can be. I don't do well in math. You're right. You ain't never studied. I'm not good in writing because you have never written before. But I dare you to fail in writing for a whole year to see if you can get to the end. I dare you to fail. I dare you to take that same class over and over again. I dare you to stop dropping classes like you soft. Always want to give up. I'm dropping. Why are you dropping? I'm so grateful that the slaves didn't drop and quit. Say, I'm just going to stop. I'm a slave. I'm just going to be a slave. I'm going to quit. Listen to me. The slaves said, we will live because one day we will become. We won't always be slaves. So today, although we're slaves, we're going to act like we're free. And one day, our children will be free. If the slaves would have just said, we quit, we give up, we would have died in the middle passage. But some slaves said, I don't care what we go through, we're going to survive this. 400 years of slavery, we're going to get through this. And you can't get through it. 1825. You can't get through a writing class and you got tutor after tutor, resource after resource. The problem is you ain't never felt no pain before. You're soft. It's a soft generation. You quit on everything. Our people did not quit. Harriet Tubman not only made it, she went back and got some more. She said, you know what, I made it, but I'm, I'm going to walk all, listen to me, shh, not ride the bus. I'm going to walk all the way back down to the south to get some more. And you quitting on 1825? Now watch this, you quit after you, listen to me, you get a sleeping bag and you wait for him. You wait for the first WRA instructor to come in and you come out to your sleeping bag, I need help. You quit after you do that. 
You quit after you had, listen to me, a, a WRA party. I'm, I'm having a party. Everybody come over. I got food, everything. And let them get over there. Let it be all the best writers. All right, I moved y'all. I want to have a writing party. I'm serious. You quit, then you ain't even tried yet. Last one, I'm sorry. Last one. Listen to me. Pain is temporary. It may last for a minute, or an hour, or a day, or even a year. But eventually, it will subside. And something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. Listen to me, I'm telling you as I leave. I'm telling you as I leave, I was homeless for two and a half years. And the problem with most of you, you never felt no pain before. Y'all spoiled. Y'all spoiled. Some of y'all spoiled. Just bottom line. Your parents have done everything for you. You never had to do nothing for yourself. You're spoiled. We're going to keep it real tonight. Some of you are spoiled brats. Every time you ever got in trouble, somebody in your house got you out of it. Every time you've done something you're not supposed to do, people say, Eric, your mother's a tyrant. You're right. She kicked me out. You're right. She's mean, but she developed a man because she put me out there and said, you're going to have to grow up. And some of you have never learned to grow up. And so every time something get hard, you quit, you call mama. I dare you to take a little pain. I dare you. I dare you not to go home. Somebody said, I don't go home, I feel bad. Go, go through it. You ain't going to die at the end of pain and success. You're not going to die because you're feeling a little pain. I'm not eating like I eat at home. That's why you're about to go to the next level, because if you keep eating like you ate at home, you'll keep being a boy or a girl. It's time to become man, woman. So don't, don't worry about a little pain. My greatest asset is I was homeless, so I can't feel a whole lot of pain. I've already been alone. There's not a whole lot of, there's not, not a whole lot of hurt I can feel on a little paper, on a little test. So I leave you, I leave you, listen to me. We have gotten to a point where it's midterms and we're moving forward. The days of you getting money, I'm not saying we're quitting, but I'm saying the day has got to go from external to internal. You have to give it everything you got. No more TV, no more parties, no more plans. If you don't have a 4.0, what you need to be doing is studying. Get off the phone. I, I, I'm sorry I'm not available until the end of this year. <laughs> no, I'm for real. You reached the right number, but you called me at the wrong time. Call me back January 1st. I'm about to get busy now. Huh? I want you to have a countdown of your own and say when the countdown is over, with the real, shh, watch me, because when I was homeless, I knew something was wrong. I knew that wasn't the best of me. And one day I said, will the real Eric Thomas please stand up? Will the real Eric Thomas please stand up? Stop being this high school dropout. Stop giving up. Stop sweeping on the street. Stop walking up and down Fico Avenue like you ain't got nothing. And get your GED. Stop being afraid to take a test. Stop being afraid to go to college because your daddy didn't go and your mama didn't go. Stop being afraid and be the best Eric Thomas you can be. But listen to me, it's going to be hard. It took me 12 years to get a four-year degree, but I got it. And guess what? On a degree, it don't have dates. So if it took you four and it took me 12, it don't show up nowhere. But I'm exactly where I wanted to be because I realized I got to commit my very being to this thing. I got I to gotta breathe it, I got to eat it, I got to sleep it. And until you get there, you'll never be successful in life. But once you get there, I guarantee you, the world is yours. So work hard and you can have whatever it is you want. Thank you guys for your time. Albert Einstein said once, he said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. I want you to get this now. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Because if you think about it, Everything you have, everything we have in this world, somebody imagined it. It's your ima imagination is tremendous. Somebody was sitting on the phone one day talking with a cord to the wall and said, man, I wish I could just go outside with this phone. 
Everybody in here got a cell phone. Somebody imagined that. Somebody got tired of riding in a wagon cross country from slavery to freedom. Somebody said, I wish we had something that made these wheels move by themselves. We drive cars. People got tired of driving from New York to LA. Somebody said, I wish we could fly. We got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Your real life, the one God really got for you, is in your imagination. It is not in your current situation or your current paycheck. And if you've been living like that, you have then restricted yourself to a commonality that is really not yours. Because what really God got for you is really in your imagination. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when I told you a minute ago, you got to have a tremendous work ethic, but you got to have a lot of faith. I talk to so many people who get older, like some of us are, and they've lost their faith. Well, faith is really simple. It's the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All that means is in the beginning, you just hope something pop up. You know, you just kind of hope something happened for you. I was hoping I would get on TV. I wrote it on a piece of paper when I was 10. I want to be on TV. The problem I had when I wrote it at 10 was I suffered from a severe stuttering problem. I could not talk outside of my house. So can you imagine when I wrote on a piece of paper, I want to be on TV and turn that in. First thing the little boy next door, next to me asked me, he did, well, how long is your TV show going to be? But when I wrote it on the paper, it wasn't factual. It was just hope. You just got to start with the hope. Faith is the substance of things that you hope for. You just hope something, Joe. Then what happened is through grace and favor, he give you a couple of them things you hope for, and then you're supposed to start believing these. Because now it turns into faith. But if you take this scripture, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What is the evidence of things not seen? I just told it to you. Albert Einstein said, imagination is the evidence. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. But guess what your imagination really is? It's the evidence of things not seen. Because your imagination, you know why it's the evidence of things not seen? Because you're the only one who can see it. Your imagination is actually God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. The moment you don't believe in your imagination, you negate what he got for you. Your imagination is the preview to life's coming attraction. It is the evidence of things not seen. Because can't nobody see it with you. Your problem is, you keep telling your imagination to the wrong people. See, if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. It's dead. How many times, man, have you had a tremendous idea? Something you thought was the one and you went and told it to your loved ones and your so-called friends and they shot it down. I mean, you was convinced that it was just, oh man, I just came to you. And you told it to me and they shot it down. And you thought since they was your loved ones and their friends and they got your best interest at heart, you believed them. You was wrong. They taught you let them talk you out of what God got for you. Some of y'all still sitting here with the ambition of opening a business one day, but you scared to go start the business because you got a job and you got bills. Rich people got bills. Everybody got bills. Hell, I got bills. You, you, who, you, everybody owes somebody something. I got something with the bank right now. You're going to let the fact that you got some bills stop you from opening the business, the thing that God didn't put in your imagination, so you're going to squash that because you got bills. Everybody got bills. Your real life is in your imagination. Can, can, you, can, you, can you grab what I'm telling you? So I don't know what you thought I was going to say to you. I'm just a real dude. I don't even have the education you all have. I flunked out of school. I flung, I ain't got no education. I don't use four syllable words. 
The only four syllable word I know is my bank account. What I'm sharing with you is stuff that everybody can apply today. If you are sitting in here thinking that you're too old to listen to what Steve, hell, I'm 60. I'm 60 years old, but I still rely on my imagination. See, if you think you're too old to make it, let me give you a prime example. Colonel Sanders. Colonel Sanders has been frying chicken his whole life. He was telling everybody he had the best chicken in the world. Ain't nobody believe him. They turned him down everywhere. Colonel Sanders didn't get a franchise till he was in his 60s. Kentucky Fried Chicken sell more chicken than anybody in the world today. So if you're sitting there thinking because you got a little gray on you, you're too late. As long as God waking you up in the morning, that's the sign that he ain't through with you. So what you tripping for? You sitting up in here like, like God can't do nothing for you because you 60. Man, you know what I'm asking God for right now? And I'm 60. If you could see my vision board, you would be, you would be blown away. Because I got enough right now. I really know. But I ain't in the need business. I'm in the want business. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting something. Quit going down to these churches y'all sitting up in here going down to, letting, keeping you in these little boxes. God got a big life for you. The only person that ain't get that, now look, and I love church, don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking church, don't you, don't, don't tweet that. No, Steve don't care for the church no more. I didn't say that. But don't go down there, memorize all these scriptures, and then don't apply none of them to your life. That's what I'm talking about. Quit going down there just to go and just get a couple of scriptures and apply them to you. Let me give you one that's real simple. See, these are these principles of success. They've taken all of these scriptures and they're putting them in books and they call them, you know, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. But totally everything in there is a scripture. They just reworded it because people don't know how to read the Bible. Like, I can't really read the King James Version. I can't. The smallest scripture I ever read changed my life. The scripture real simple. You have not, because you ask not. Do you know the difference that that could make in your life? I'm just giving you real talk now. I'm just trying to tell you how I got here. See, I, I have no education. I applaud all of you with your education. I've seen sitting there talking to so many men who have in, in, in corporate America and all I, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of that because I don't have that. But you sit here and you take what you have and it could be so much more if you would ask. See, you have not because you ask not. When the last time you really asked him for something? Or do you keep making requests that's inside the confines of your paycheck. When you gonna get outside of that? Didn't I just tell you God ain't in your paycheck? Didn't I just tell you he ain't in your job title? The life God got for you is in your imagination. Why you still imagine this stuff? Why you keep dreaming of a summer home? Why you keep dreaming of retirement? Leaving your grandkids money? So I'm at the age now where I think about my grandkids. I got seven TV shows. Dog, I only need one. One show pay me enough money. I do not live my life in the confines of what anybody says to me. I let my imagination go, and now imagination is a preview to life's coming, to life's coming attraction. But what that really means is, is God showing you a preview of what he has for you. So now, if you have not cause you ask not, do you understand if you up your ask, he has to up his give? This period. This is simple stuff that anybody can apply. You ain't even got to have no degree to do this. You don't even have to have no money to do this. You can start this today and change your whole game. Because you're going to need grace and favor anyway. You need to dream the faith and then he put his grace and favor on top of it. You gone. But you got to ask for something. If you up your ass, he got to up his gear, period. Listen, I have asked God for some tremendous stuff. Everything he hasn't given to me, 
is on the way. I have no doubt about it. Why would he not? See, let, can, can I tell you what really prompted this thinking in me? When I was homeless, I lived in a car for three years. I made some decisions in my life, man, and threw myself off a cliff. My decision in October, uh, October 8th, 1985, I walked into a comedy club for the first time. Had never heard of a comedy club. All my life, I wanted to be on TV. So I ran up on stage. I'm doing, I don't even know what to do, but I just started talking about boxing and stuff that happened to me. Audience was hollering, laughing. They brought all 10 of us back up on stage. They had a clap off. I won the clap off. I won $50. I cried from Cuyahoga Falls to Cleveland. The girl kept saying, why are you crying? It ain't but $50. I said, no, you don't understand. It's way more than 50. This is what I do. She said, what you mean this is what you do? This is just your first time. Uh, you don't understand. Something happened to me. I won amateur night. I went to work the next day, October 9th, 1985, and quit my job. You've all seen this book I got out, this video called Jump. Oh, I jumped. Now, I don't recommend that you do it that way, because two years later, I was homeless. Because <laughs> the first year of comedy, I made $3,400. The next year, I made $4,800. And the third year, I made $5,300. I got a wife, a set of twins. I'm sending every dollar I got to them. So I tried to live on $50, $75 a week. Gas was $0.38 cent a gallon back then. I just stayed in my car. So I lived in my car for three years. Three years. I lived in my car and what happened was I just said man so I used to fish all the time to eat because I'm a fisherman I'm a bass fisherman so I used to stop at lakes and ponds and just fish and every night every month I get run off from somebody's land hey get away from here hey move along that's not yours hey stop fishing here I just get run off and he didn't understand. And one time I had fish on the line. They said, you got fish on that line? I said, yeah, throw them back. I had to throw them back because I used to stop at rest areas with them little cast iron grills. I kept charcoal in my car. I started a fire and I eat fish. There's some days I wouldn't eat. So that they thought I was just fishing, but I was eating. So I said one day, I said, man, you know what? One day, man, I'm going I'm to I'm give myself some land. I'm going to buy myself a piece of dirt. So fast forward, God bless me. I get on TV when I'm 38. I'm on Showtime at the Apollo. Lord, have mercy. They gave me my money. I saved my money up. I saved $250,000. I said, I'm going to give me some land. I went to Texas, and I'm about to buy some land. But before I went to buy the land, I was curious. I just had the thought. I said, man, I wonder how much land is on earth? How, how many acres is on earth? Because you know it's not going to change. You know, God lets you fly. God lets you dive on the water. God don't let you make dirt. Can't make dirt. So I looked it up. It's roughly over, just a little bit over, 36 billion acres of land. 36 billion acres of land. So I just got a little bit more curious. And I said, well, how many people on earth? I looked it up, and it was about six billion people on earth. So I did some Steve Harvey thinking. I said, okay, if it's 36 billion acres of land, and it's about six billion people on earth, everybody ought to have six acres of land. Not just me, you know, I just, just thinking. So I asked God, could I have six acres? That's all I wanted. Because you know the one thing I wanted? I didn't care if I put a house on it or nothing. I just wanted to be a stand somewhere and couldn't nobody run me off. You know, man, I was in a world of hurt. I was so sick of just getting, just getting run off, man, every time I stopped somewhere. So I got this money, man. I saved my money. I saved $250,000. I'm going and I'm looking for some land. 
first day I get there, I see a piece of land in Texas, so beautiful, I couldn't believe it. it had rolling hills, had a pond on it where I could fish. I, the dude took me over there, I look at the land, and I'm, and I'm looking out, I said, man, this is great right here. I said, sir, how much is this right here? He said, well, it's about $600,000. I said, man, I ain't, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, how much do you have? I said, I got 250000 I said, well, let me think about it, man. He said, let me think about it. And I was standing there, and then I stopped. I said, sir, can I ask you a question, man? How many acres of land is that? He said, this is six acres. Six. Six years ago. I just asked God, just give me six. See, I didn't want a whole lot of acres. I just wanted my cut. Just give me my six. And so I said, ain't this crazy? So I thought about it. I said, man, what can we work out? Right before I got ready to say it, the guy that took me over there said, Steve, let me show you something right quick. He took me over to this hillbilly's house. He took me to his house. He said, let me show you something. It took me over and showed me this land, and it was massive. It had three lakes on it. It had rolling hills. It had trees. It was unbelievable, man. I said, man, this is incredible. I said, man, how much is this? He said, this 16 acres. I said, hey, man, I ain't got that kind of money. Let me go on back over here to this dude where I can, Mike can cut a deal. He said, well, let me ask you something. What was you going to give that man over there? I said, well, I hadn't worked it out yet because all I got is $250,000. He said, well, listen, I'm in a little bit of a tight right now. <laughs> said, if you can bring me 250000 cash by tomorrow, i give you this 16 acres. I showed up next day, $250,000. 16 acres see that's grace and favor right there that's what that is so my first piece of land was 250 acres so i said man this is the land that i'm gonna save for my family i'm gonna fish on the rest of my life i'm gonna be an old man so then i got to thinking i said hold up man you mean you have not because you asked now i asked for six six years ago he showed me six but he gave me 16 so i went to god I said, God, listen to this. I'm from Cleveland. I got a couple partners that's locked up. They probably won't be using they six. Now, let me tell you something. I'm so busy now, I don't even get to go to that ranch. I never can go. And I thought I was going to be fishing and save it for my kids the rest of life. But God had another plan for me. That's the ranch that I have my mentoring camp on. I bring a thousand black boys out there with a thousand single mothers. And that was the purpose of that ranch. I never go there to fish at all. But see, that's what I wanted. I thought that's what it was for. But God got another plan. His way is way bigger than yours. You can't even see his way. But you gotta start to hustle. You gotta give God something to work with. Look, if you start hustling, and grinding, he'll fill it up for you. I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks. Nothing. Nelson Mandela said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. Now I'm sure in your experiences in school and applying to college and picking your major and deciding what you want to do with life, I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to fall back on. Make sure you got something to fall back on, honey. But I never understood that concept, having something to fall back on. If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything. 
I want to fall forward. I figure at least this way I'll see what I'm going to hit. Without consistency, you'll never finish. So do what you feel passionate about, passionate about. Take chances. Don't be afraid to fail. There's an old IQ test was nine dots. And you had to draw five lines with a pencil within these nine dots without lifting the pencil. The only way to do it was to go outside the box. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Don't be afraid to fail big, to dream big. But remember, dreams without goals are just dreams. Reggie Jackson struck out 2,600 times in his career, the most in the history of baseball. But you don't hear about the strikeouts. People remember the home runs fall forward. Thomas Edison conducted 1,000 failed experiments. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because the 1,001st was the light bulb. Fall forward. Every failed experiment is one step closer to success. You've got to take risks, and I'm sure you've probably heard that before, but I want to talk to you about why that's so important. You will fail at some point in your life, accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. There's no doubt about it. And I know that's probably not a traditional message for a graduation ceremony, but hey, I'm telling you, embrace it because it's inevitable. In the acting business, you fail all the time. Early on in my career, I auditioned for a part in a Broadway musical. Perfect role for me, I thought, except for the fact that I can't sing. I didn't get the job. But here's the thing, I didn't quit. I didn't fall back. I walked out of there to prepare for the next audition and the next audition and the next audition. I prayed, I prayed, and I prayed, but I continued to fail, and fail, and fail, but it didn't matter, because you know what, there's an old saying, you hang around the barbershop long enough, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut, so you will catch a break, and I did catch a break, last year, I did a play called Fences on Broadway. But here's the kicker. It was at the court theater. It was at the same theater that I failed that first audition 30 years prior. The point is, every graduate here today has the training and the talent to succeed. But do you have the guts to fail? If you don't fail, you're not even trying. I'll say it again. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. So imagine you're on your deathbed, and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your unfulfilled potential. The ghost of the ideas you never acted on the ghost of the talents you didn't use and they're standing around your bed angry, disappointed and upset they say we, we came to you because you could have brought us to life they say and now we have to go to the grave together so I ask you today how many ghosts are going to be around your bed when your time comes? I just got back from South Africa. It's a beautiful country. But there are places there with terrible poverty that need help. 
And Africa is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. The Middle East needs your help. Japan needs your help. Alabama needs your help. Tennessee needs your help. Louisiana needs your help. Philadelphia needs your help. The world needs a lot and we need it from you. We really do. We need it from you young people. I mean, I'm not speaking for the rest of us up here, but I know I'm getting a little grayer. We need it from you, the young people, because remember this. You got to get out there. You got to give it everything you got, whether it's your time, your, your, your talent, your prayers, or your treasures. What are you going to do with what you have? I'm not talking about how much you have. Some of you are business majors, some of you are theologians, nurses, sociologists, some of you have money, some of you have patience, some of you have kindness, some of you have love, some of you have the gift of long suffering, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, what are you going to do with what you have? All right, now here's my last point about failure. Sometimes it's the best way to figure out where you're going. Your life will never be a straight path. I began at Fordham University as a pre-med student. I, I took a course called the Cardiac Morphogenesis. I couldn't read it, I couldn't say it, I sure couldn't pass it. So then I decided to go into pre-law, then journalism. And with no academic focus, my grades took off in their own direction. I was a 1.8 GPA. And the university very politely suggested that it might be better to take some time off. I was 20 years old, I was at my lowest point. And then one day, and I remember the exact day, March 27, 1975, I was helping my mother in her beauty shop. My mother owned a beauty shop up in Mount Vernon. And there's, there was this older woman who was uh, considered one of the elders in the town. And, I didn't know her personally, but I, I was looking in the mirror, and every time I looked at the mirror, I could see her behind me, and she was staring at me. She just kept looking at me. Every time I looked at her, she kept giving me these strange looks. So she finally took the dryer off her head and said, to some, she said something I'll never forget. She said, young boy, I have a prophecy, a spiritual prophecy. She said, you are going to travel the world and speak to millions of people. And in the years that followed, just as that woman prophesied, I have traveled the world and I have spoken to millions of people through my movies. Millions who up till this day couldn't see me, I, who, who up till this day I couldn't see while I was talking to them and they couldn't see me, they could only see the movie. They couldn't see the real me. But I see you today. And I'm encouraged by what I see. And I'm strengthened by what I see. Because taking risk is not just about going for a job. It's also about knowing what you know and what you don't know. It's about being open to people and to ideas. The chances you take, the people you meet, the people you love, the faith that you have, that's what's going to define you. Never be discouraged, never hold back, give everything you got. And when you fall throughout life, remember this, fall forward.